you know, I, I want to engage you guys a little bit tonight, today. Uh, some of you have asked some questions. Uh, how many of you are landowners? Okay. And, and how many of you as landowners turkey hunt? All right. Did, did, how many of you came here today maybe looking at some opportunity for cost shares to improve your land for timber plot? I'm trying to figure what y'all's angle is here. Uh, you know, these guys, this is a great group. Uh, I kind of question Patrick, you know, coming into cost to come to an event like this, but you know, you're really fortunate to get some of the expertise that these guys have provided for you. All right. Uh, great to be here with you. We're talking about something I love. I think all these guys have a passion uh, for wild turkeys. And uh, what is so cool about this bird is that it is so adapted to lots of different habitats. So, you know, there's so many things that we can do to, to make it better. You know, I say it's kind of a match made in heaven, long beards and long leaf. And I'm 54 years old, and believe it or not, I hadn't known anything very much other than that's a long leaf tree until about a year and a half ago. And coming back to work for NWTF and taking some time to go to the Long Leaf Academy, which if you ever get to go to Andalusia and, and go through that program, it is awesome to really understand the value as a landowner if your land and your, and your is a historical longleaf area. Now I'm going to kind of capture this today a little bit. We'll, we can talk about turkeys and you're going to see some things that have been said already that are, are values to, to uh, managing turkeys on your land, but I'm going to focus on longleaf and turkeys because there is a wonderful call share right now. It's been going on for a couple of years. Joel alluded to it through NRCS. Even there are grants and other dollars through Fish and Wildlife and the Partners Program. Uh, and maybe even, I know, the Mississippi Forestry Commission, they call share some to do uh, with Longley. So, you know, you need to be seeking a lot of these different agencies and professionals to look at opportunities to help you. I mean, you may have plenty of money, uh, but just the expertise that these folks are going to provide you and the guidance, hopefully they're going to route you in the right way. Uh, NWTF is involved with a, a long leaf restoration uh, partnership project. With, we have dollars from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and other entities that we're trying to deliver in seven states right now, this long leaf restoration. At one time there was 93 million acres of long leaf in the U.S. And right now there's like 3.4. So as you can see, there is, that's why a lot of federal dollars are being spent to restore this back to traditional landscapes. And what's, what's cool about it is you've got to get in the mindset this is not a 25 year rotation. It's a longer commitment, but it's going to be better for wildlife. It's incredible, the species diversity that you find on this property that you manage. This is kind of the historical range. I was talking to Ted and he said he knew me from 20 years ago, and I said, man, I'm getting old here. And, you know, we start talking about historical range. This is kind of what we've been given as a map. Does that mean that longleaf couldn't grow in some of these other areas? Probably not. But, but if you're looking at funding for your land, if you fall into this area, probably worth, you know, checking into with your local county uh, NRCS office. Uh, and, and longleaf is going to benefit, as you've heard today, a lots of species, quail, non-game species, and so on. We've been involved for several years right now in some restoration projects uh, across the southeast, and uh, we're continuing to hire biologists to work with landowners. And one of the programs that I want to uh, <clears throat> kind of suggest to you guys today that we're going to offer, and I want this to complement people like Joel and the private lands biologists. We're not in competition. We're working together to, to kind of tell this story. And we're going to have a chance in the next couple months to provide uh, 50 uh, management plans for you as landowners for free. Come to your property, spend a day with you, write a plan that's NRCS compatible, and, allow, and hopefully encourage you to go in and sign up for Lonely for Restoration on your land. Free. So that's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, does it take the place? You know, I hope that as we do this, and Joel, we're kind of just easing into this thing, we want to work closely with the department and other people in this so that we're all saying the same message and maybe even go together 
you know, to do that. So uh, we'll be hiring a full-time biologist in uh, Alabama in the next two months, and he is going to be housed somewhere south of Birmingham uh, so that we can work really the southwest and southeast portions of the state. And, of course, you know, Longleaf goes on up into this area around Talladega with a montane species. You've seen pictures like this today. I mean, it's almost like, okay, class, you know, what are we, what are we uh, managing for here? You know, nest and cover and brood habitat. Hopefully, when you leave today, you're going to be able to say, does my land have some of these components if you like wild turkeys? Because that's the key. And just like Claude was saying, you know, when you can walk across a road and you've got brood habitat on one side and nest and cover on the other, you know, that's another question you need to ask yourself. If you don't have that, they're leaving your property probably. So you find this, what's kind of interesting, you know, this is on Oak Mulgee National Forest. These are uh, mountain uh, longleaf. Uh, so you've got these things growing from the hills to, you know, the real sandy coastal plain uh, counties. You've got longleaf in mixed, in mixed uh, hardwood stands. This is on uh, Pison Ridge in Louisiana, some uh, army land. Uh, so turkeys use these, these areas too. And the burning's, you know, the key. NWTF's been involved with the state. We, we've been involved on both Barber, WMA, and uh, Fred T. Stimson in the last four years in doing some restoration. I was fortunate enough to meet these guys the day that this truckload of, of trees came in. I got to help them unload it. So I had to establish my, you know, validity right off the bat. But hopefully they don't talk too bad about me. Uh, but, you know, really kind of a cool thing to see on both public and private land, the efforts being made uh, to restore lonely. And, you know, if you, if you guys are like me, initially even two years ago, I didn't have a clue about it. I'd heard Lob Lolly Plantations. I'd worked for a timber company for 20 years. You know, we went from a 40 to a 35 to a 25-year rotation and was bought out by a warehouser. You know, and the species diversity of your land, you know, was just kind of minimal. And the neat thing about longleaf is I've gotten into it and looked at the richness from plants and animals. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's like this, trying to wrap your arms around it. So if you like recreation and wildlife on your land, this is a really great species to, to manage for. But as our, our speakers have said today, it's, it's all about thinning and burning and getting that sunlight to the ground. So this is just one tree that you find that, that allows that. I heard somebody mention a while ago about, you know, burning these trees. I mean, what's so cool is a year into the ground, you're burning this track and you're setting the succession back every two to three years depending on your fuel. And you're getting like <coughs> the panicles. It's, it's kind of like a, a natural brown top millet and your bunch grasses that you see right here with the clean ground around it for your, your ground nesting birds and these chicks and poles. This is uh, I mean, uh, Fred T. Stimson over Jackson. We talked about forbs, we talked about you know wildlife openings, we're looking at these guys are checking survival as we planted the trees. Uh, again, you know when I, when I work with the Forest Service or with People, we talk, start talking about things like pollinators for bees and butterflies. You know, I represent turkey hunters, 260,000 of them with our organization. And when they say, look, you know, you're spending the money to do things for red cockaded woodpeckers and gopher tortoises and, you know, butterflies and native grass and flowers and bees and butterflies, I said, yep. I said, because that's brood habitat and nesting cover. Period. I don't care what you call it. For me, it's a lot of turkeys running around there that I get to enjoy, you know, listen to God in the spring. So, you know, if that's what we need to say to get to where we want to be, I'm cool with that, you know. So, you've got these species like this, and it really has been very interesting to me to see our Mississippi State Chapter President, who came to a field day in August this year at Red Creek WMA in Mississippi with 80 other landowners and all of a sudden said, man, this is cool. I've never known about this. Goes back to his property. He's a lawyer in Pascagoula. Takes a turkey oak ridge and hires a hydro axe, a big mulcher to go in and clear off about 10 acres. Spent $8,500. 
But before he did it, we marked every gopher toward his hole. He said, Luke, why are we doing this? I said, because in the future, when you're working with partners for wildlife, with the fish and wildlife, you're going to rank high by managing these gopher tortoises where your turkeys are. So when we start talking about this ranking, Joel, you know, when he's got that gopher tortoise on his land, he's going to be at the top of the list. I promise you. For funding. Uh, we've talked about roads and, and areas to manage that you've got wildlife openings. You know, to me, I worked in Texas where the limiting factor in the panhandle of Texas was trees to roost in along creeks and rivers. In the southeast, you know, you think back about your tenure, wildlife openings. And wildlife openings are a lot of things. It's not just a food plot. It's not just a field. It could be the spatial distribution of your trees, as we talked about today, the thinning and the burning. And it's certainly the structure, you know, for these birds to use. Again, we've talked, you know, about different plants. You know, that clean ground for this for this pole to get in, and our chick. That's a that's a quail chick. I mean, you know, I tell people my analogy when I'm talking to folks. I'm kind of a simple redneck guy, and you know, you're trying to explain to just the common landowner. You know, what do you have to have, Luke, to grow turkeys that first six or eight weeks of your life? So I go to a table. And I lay my head down on it, and I think this is that quail and that turkey's world for six weeks. Just like we're, we're looking at right here. Can you imagine the thickness that they see in there, you know? So, you know, and everything's after that animal to eat it from the time it's in an egg till it gets on up, at least till the fall of the year, six months to where it's smart enough, fast enough, to fly and get away from stuff. And it's still trying to elude predators. So the education and, and giving people choices how to manage their land, to me, is, is a very key component. And also the fact that we've got all our agencies and NGOs, everybody's out here trying to survive, pay for their programs, but we need to be saying the same message. We need to be working together, all of us. This is wonderful, Patrick, to put this group of people together, but even funding and professional opportunities to help you as landowners is what we need to be doing because there's not a better time when, when times are tight for us to be working together as partners and saying the same message, you know, so we're not kind of shotgunning this thing. A lot, there's a lot of dollars right now still available uh, for these programs and so we need to, you know, I appreciate you guys kind of, y'all been very attentive today, there's a lot of stuff being thrown at you. And when you have successful events, oh, there's, I didn't realize I had here, Stevie, you're pointing away. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when you have successful events, like I was just a uh, privilege to be part of with 290 people, and 80 landowners say, we want to know more about long, rest, long leaf restoration. That's, that's pretty cool. And it takes time. You don't just plan, Patrick, as you know, we've been planning and working on you know, this event for several months, and it takes time to put together strong events to do that. So, as we're working with NRCS, you know, eventually we're going to be looking at trying to develop plans and maps for this program. We're looking at, it's called a Long Leaf Pine Initiative. Uh, we partner in the next 18 months in, in just Alabama to do 50 management plans. So our biologist, that's going to be part of his major uh, goal is to go out there and help you. You know, the thing that I want to do, Joel, is I want to make sure exactly what you said, that we know what that landlord's objective is. I mean, he's thinking about this from a funding standpoint. You know, I just clear cut my timber. Sure would be nice to get 75% cost share to do site prep, seedling purchase, planting, and prescribed burns for 15 years. You know, so there's a 15-year requirement or commitment for you as a landowner, you know, to grow that tree there on that property. Okay, again, 75% cost share, and there's probably three to four prescribed burns during that time frame. You know, uh, the thing I like about it is you're never out of turkey habitat, as opposed to loblolly pines, about three or four years of age that you've seen some pictures of. The, the vegetative growth underneath them has diminished or become somewhat of a barrier, and that's because of the spatial distribution and the repetition of fire out there with that. So planning, you know, right off the bat is key. 
And that, and I still think as you're going through this program, you're still tweaking on your land. You know, you're compartmentalizing your land. You may be looking at landowners with 15 acres or 40 acres. It doesn't have to be big pieces of property because a 15 acre pine plantation, once you burn it, is a food plot. 15 acre food plot. Okay, so that's how cool that is. Uh, you know, working on linear roads and things like that as, you, as you're managing and doing your forest plan, Ted, you know, this is when you really start implementing. It's like a canvas and you're painting a picture of what you want to have on that property 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. You got to think about, do I want to daylight roads out to 40 feet right now? Do I need to take additional trees off this edge if I want that road to be more, to have more sunlight? Do I want to you know, enlarge that log landing or log set that's going to become a permanent wildlife opening. And, you know, from the very get-go, the first time you enter that stand, uh, you know, we talked about linear roads that go through your property. This one is coming back from fallow disking. Uh, you can see the Parker's P on the left there. I mean, this would be the kind of place a hen could travel, like we're talking about, from from stand to stand, bringing her pulse, she can escape into that cover very easily. Uh, and they do, and they do use openings and roads a lot for access and just uh, foraging and feeding. Uh, this is a long leaf pl pine plantation on the uh, the Soda Ranger District, and we're doing a stewardship project out there where we're creating 50 acres of openings. In October, we started harvesting the timber. It was shear piled and raked, actually it was grubs, excuse me, and put into wind rows and planted into a nurse crop. Uh, we put 10 vernal ponds on there and we'll be looking at going back. And these are real small, shallow, 18, 24 inch ponds, amphibians. And then we'll be looking at planting native warm season grasses. But this is a one year old stand of, of uh, long leaf uh, and it creates a lot of diversity. You know, in, Ten years, this is you have to walk into this behind a locked gate a half a mile. This is a turkey hunter's dream. Because he can, you know, he can go in there and let you know where these are. Uh, we'll have uh, 50 of those in the next 10 years. You know, that's that's what you're we're trying to accomplish is creating that diversity like several people have talked about. You know, one of the things that that as I've gotten into this, guys, and I'm talking maybe some professionals, but we we're talking about native warm season grasses, but the availability of the seed source and the contractors to plant it are few and far between. I mean, you count almost on one hand how many grain drills there are. True axe grain drills with flood capabilities in a state. And so we've got to address that need if we're going to promote this. And I really do believe that we can save people money. Because if you're buying seed fertilized, if you're buying Ladino clover for $4.50 a pound and you're paying $15 a bag for triple 13 every year, you're spending a bunch of money. If you could take 15 acres of your 30 food plots and put them into native warm season grasses, and, and all you got to do is maintain it by fire or bush hogging or fallow disking, you save yourself a lot of money. The question that we have to ask, and you know, those pictures, Ted, that you have are, are, are great. I'm looking for that photograph of that nice buck standing in a feathered edge about to walk into a clover field at 5.30 in the afternoon. I'm looking for, you know, the, the 10 gobblers standing in a native warm season grass field because you know what? That's the same thing Toxie Hayes is promoting with biologic. Okay? Maybe we need to get Toxie Hayes saying this and it ring a little louder, but, you know, it's uh, you know, it's going to save people money. So that clean ground that we're talking about, you know, it's very important. We talk about you know native grasses. It's a bunch grass. It grows like this, with with stuff around the edge that you've got these small poles can can get around on as it begins to grow up. You've got some clean ground. They're like a chicken. They want to put their feet on the ground a lot of times. Uh, we mentioned the uh, huckleberries and. The patches, I mean, this is kind of redundant. I think, again, you know, it's, you know, hopefully today's school for you guys, you're going to realize the value of native warm season grasses and the, what the structure provides for it. Uh, this is up on Skyline WMA in North 
East Alabama uh, there a couple months ago. And uh, Frank Allen, you guys probably know Frank. I'm going to tell you what, field day. Incredible WMA. Guys got going on, him and his staff. And, you know, we need to, and I'm sure it's like this on many of our state WMAs here, but, you know, both the Forest Service and our state WMAs are the, they always have been the places to educate people. We need to get people back to the field. I'm telling you, there's something about being in, in a class today, but when you can get out there and see it on the ground, it rings. You can say, hey, I got a place just like that on my land, I can do that. And it, and it just connects, you know, with doing that. So, uh, road edges, fields, field edges, uh, you know, they're, they're important. We talked about mulching. You know, and, and uh, I think uh, Mark, we were, I don't know if Mark's left or not, but we were talking about instant gratification with the mulch, and it's expensive. But you can get, you know, an area cleaned up immediately, and if you can look at, at fire after this, you're running, you know. And some people can afford to do this, some can't. And don't think that, you know, I've got to go out there and do 100 acres. I mean, hey, you know, if you had a guy out there for two or three days or a couple of days, you know, you could create two or three acres at a time and move to another site and really develop some areas in my mind. It's, you know, I call it sculpting, you know, the landscape. So you can see the vegetation that they took down from behind here. There's all that sweet gum and, uh, you know, different mid-story species that, you know, we're fighting even sometimes not being able to accomplish and getting them down to a fire. Where were those pictures taken? Uh, this was taken with Joe Koloski. I borrowed these pictures from him. I don't know where they were taken. He was our former, uh, it was either Mississippi or Alabama. I don't know, so I'm sorry. Uh, this was back up on Skyline right here, and some of you are probably, may or may not be familiar, we've got a prescribed fire council uh, with the state. Uh, promoting the use of fire, and I think you're going to be seeing some field days and things where we're actually talking to people about how to conduct a burn, becoming certified as private landowners. That's probably the next progression in this long leaf and land management push is for us to begin to try to help people do this on their own so they don't feel like that, you know, I could, it would be easy to go out and do five acres. Now, I might not want to do 500 if it's the first time I've done a fire. You know, and I would, and I really wouldn't suggest a landowner if he's never done a prescribed burn to just strike out and do it on his own. He needs to get some assistance. But we need to, as we become more uh, desirous of having this fire as a component for land management, we want to get more people in the long leaf, more people using fire, because politically, if we don't, we're going to lose this as a tool. You know, so we need those advocates to do that. And so these are just the last thing I'm going to kind of leave you with is, is uh, you know, some shots of, of putting a fire through an area. This is a, a, a long leaf area here. You can see it's a relatively young stand, probably one to two years old. Did we burn those trees up? If we did it at the right time of year, we didn't. If the candles weren't, weren't uh, forming, which they are in this case, which is a new growth. That's what that place looks like. I mean, suppose Salem Salon's a turkey. That's four years old. You know, you can get around through this. You can quail hunt through this. A deer can hide in this. It's got plenty of food, you know, in a place like this. And again, that spatial distribution to me is what's just kind of exciting me about what we're doing here. Plus the fact that if a man can wait four years, this is a highest quality tree you can sell. I mean, even in a bad, bad time, you're going to make some money. Okay, that's all I've got.